dinner. And he would have them in that back room of the social science lab, sitting around crazy little tables that were, that were beaten up tables from the 1920s that were really for, for uh, student use. And half of the 20 would be Tougaloo students. Uh, the other half would be outsiders, many of them white. And he told his African-American students to come early and occupy every other chair. So when the whites came, they had to sit with the blacks in between. For both sets of people, it was likely the first time that they had ever eaten with someone from the opposite race. Very, very awkward often. Uh, a sophomore student who had never been in that situation and a 60-year-old white lady who had also never been in that situation. He was a facilitator. He brought you together and then you were on your own and I mean he didn't have to guide the conversations or anything. He, got, he always had an eclectic, interesting sort of mix of people around him. Berinsky was always concerned about reading and scholarship, and he felt that because he spent all his time reading books, that everybody else should spend all of their time reading. I'm sitting out on the campus on one of the benches with two young ladies, just chilling, as they say today, and Berinsky walks up to me, you know, the four by four Berinsky, lamb sideways, he's the same height. Mr. Cunningham, you should be reading as I speak. And he goes on, he goes on this thing for like, this rag for like 20 some minutes. And several days later, when I come in to do my little bit as a research assistant, he apologizes profusely, you know. Oh, I realize you were with young ladies and that was inappropriate and so on and so forth. Students didn't quite know what to make of him. They certainly knew that he wasn't a white Mississippian. They kind of treated him with a great deal of affection as a curiosity, an interesting man. Uh, they developed a nickname for him, and everyone knew that nickname except Berinsky, we thought. Uh, the nickname was Bobo. When I got out of graduate school, he invited me back uh, at least twice to, uh, to speak at his forums, and he asked me if I would be his house guest, and, and I said, of course. I mean, I, I had never seen how he lived <laughs> before, so it was very nice, and I remember he made um, um, uh, Pate, and he taught me how to make pate. He took uh, liverwurst, um, Worcestershire sauce, and chopped onion, finely chopped onion, and he mixed it together and, and uh, made a spread with it. So I still make <laughs> pate like he made it. He had families in the white community that he was very close to. He had families in the black community that he was very close to and he was a bridge trying to connect these, these communities as best he could. He, um, he was extremely successful in doing this and challenging the system. When I was older, I asked him, Dr. Bernske, how is it that you got this lab and why did you bring people together? He said, because I didn't do civil rights demonstrations. I didn't go out to protest and to go to jail, but I also felt that each person in his own way could make a contribution, and mine was to have people share ideas. And what a powerful statement that was. So now today, because we have learned from our great black leaders, when we say black power, some hokey says, you mean violence. And then he expects us to say, uh-uh, boss man, oh, we don't mean violence. Later for the hokey, later for him. Later for him. later for him. By the late 1960s, the civil rights movement had yielded to the struggle for black power. For many of the refugee scholars, this change in the political landscape would have a significant impact. The Black Power Movement was a difficult period for many white faculty members because the Black Power Movement was all about black separatism. There was a lot of frustration with not being able to affect as much change as there should have been. So one of the responses, and I should emphasize just one of them, was that we should have black power, that perhaps the only way we are going to have any real leverage in the society is by empower, helping to empower black people to have their own voice. There was a strong feeling that blacks should identify with blacks. 
there was a similar catharsis going on around the country about this struggle about what does freedom mean? To what extent do we have to achieve it on our own? To what extent can we work with whites who are supportive? I designed a course called the race problem or, or Negro problem. I do not remember exactly what title it was. It was in, it was, was in, in, I think, in the catalog. And I gave it a, a first, the first year I gave it as a, a non-credit course, and there also some of my colleagues took part, and we had real dis historical discussion, I mean, without enmity, without uh, venom, as far as I uh, remember. I mean, I think initially that was a big success, and uh, generated a lot of interest and support. And over time, if I understood him correctly, um, there became a larger group who wondered what he was doing teaching it and should this really be taught by a white man? And, and I think it's part of his sort of philosophical bent to wonder about that himself. The black power movement, which talked about blacks seizing control of our own institutions, also talked about us seizing control of our history, which meant, at least at the superficial level, that we ought to write the history of the experience of black folks in America, which meant white folks shouldn't teach it. I went to a luncheon at MIT once, and it was students who had been uh, in Morehouse, and Benjamin E. Mays, who was a, a Morehouse president, had been their mentor. And they were all giving these great Benny Mays stories and how he had shaped their lives, and this really, this black man, this strong black intellectual, had shaped their lives in, these, in this critical way. And I, and, and I remember sitting in that, in that luncheon feeling a bit awkward because my mentor was not a black man. He was a white Jewish immigrant. And so I'm, I'm sort of thinking as they're thinking, they were saying all these things about how as men they were learning how to negotiate the world because they had had this black man as a role model. And I was thinking, well, so what does this mean for me in terms of how I view the world and the things that I want to do? Lone Fair was a very practical man, and he gave very sound advice to all of his students. And he insisted that I get a, a doctorate degree. And he always said, John, you got to teach. You can't even guess the richness that we're letting go down the drain. All of that talent is, is lying out there in that terrible uh, ghetto. And he was right. I got ready to go to graduate school. I didn't have the money for all the applications, so Dr. Berinsky sat down and wrote the checks for me. And when I got my degree, four years later, he was the first person I called to tell him I just defended my dissertation. Sent me a, a letter with a $100 check and said, take this money and you and your friends go out to dinner because you deserve it. I wrote a book called White Papers. I thought some of the ideas and some of the ways of thinking, ways of approaching and interpreting situations uh, were influenced by Dr. Pappenheim. And I dedicated the book to him because I wanted to give some back to him, I suppose, you know. And I thought, I thought that would be nice, you know. But he never lived to see it, you know. He, <laughs> Dr. Manassi came here. Nobody had a place where the immigrants go. And Dr. Shepard offered him the job, brought him down, and helped to get him and his young family set up. And he remained indebted to Dr. Shepard for that. At least he remained committed. He spent a semester at Princeton, and I would ask him, well, you, Doc, you were at Princeton. Why didn't you stay? He said, oh, I could never do that. Uh, and even when I said, well, you know, Dr. Shepard is dead, I said, I could never do that. I will always stay here.
Major funding for this program was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding was provided by the following.